about seven years of experience of promoting campaigns on mobile, and I'm happy to share everything I've learned with you guys. Uh, Liquid Wireless is the mobile marketing arm of Publishers Clearinghouse, the old marketing company you're familiar with from direct mail and everything. We take everything they've done in direct mail and bring it into mobile now. Uh, one of our primary responsibilities is to promote the PCH sweepstakes offer, you know, the multi-million dollar giveaways on mobile devices, and you can see it in a phone right there. My presentation is about 25 minutes, uh, so we've got plenty of extra time, so feel free to stop me at any point uh, to ask questions, or we have plenty of time at the end to answer questions. Also with me is uh, Chris Copeland, who's our business development manager, and he can you know, answer some of your questions as well. So one of the first things I want to figure out is how many of you have uh, promoted any campaigns on mobile at all? Okay, cool. So it's mattering. How many of you have done that successfully? Okay, a little bit smaller. <laughs> so, all right. So hopefully by the end of this, uh, we'll get you started and uh, on a good course to do more of it. So first is why mobile? Uh, as you can see from this chart in eMarketer, mobile is growing very quickly. In the outer years, it looks like desktop web is actually starting to pull back. Meanwhile, mobile is growing from about $7 billion in advertising this year uh, to about $30 billion or so in a few years, and it'll be comparable to desktop. So really, this is the time you want to start learning and getting into mobile because it's, it's here, it's big, and it's, it's getting bigger. So we're going to go over a couple of things. First, I just want to go over some basics of mobile advertising, make sure we all have a common ground about different traffic types, ad formats, media sources. And then we're going to go through uh, basically a sample campaign and think about how we're going to make ads that can work, selecting sources, negotiating prices with them, and then optimizing that campaign to be more effective. Uh, so first, what are the different traffic types? There's two big types to start off. One is mobile web. And so that would be people who are surfing the web on their phone through something like Safari. And so if you go to usatoday.com or something like that, on, through your web browser on your phone, that would be mobile web. The biggest component of mobile web advertising space is definitely search, and almost all of that's Google. So a tremendous amount of Google's clicks now are exclusively mobile. Another area is display. So that would be anything from your news sites, again, like a USA Today, to all sorts of kind of more niche mobile sites. And then there are also different offer flows and lead flows, where people have a flow of offers on the mobile web, and you can tap into those. Another big area is uh, in-app. And so that's, you know, that would be a native application, you know, either iOS or Android, someone download from the App Store, and then there are ad placements with inside that. The first big one is display. That traditionally was a, a good sized part where you'd have you know, Angry Birds or something in the upper right hand corner you'd have a banner ad. That, there's a lot of ad units like that, they're not super effective and so that's not one of the bigger areas. Another one is push notifications. So that's when you're on your phone and you get a notification through the alerts bar. So it's almost like an SMS, you know, it comes to the user and they can then, they're notified. Uh, Next is hosted forms. There's different companies like Poniflex and others who can host a lead gen or other kind of form right with inside the app. The neat thing with that is the user doesn't even have to leave the app at all. You know, they can see the ad unit and tap to register or something like that. Uh, next is forms of uh, virtual currency. So a lot of games on, uh, it, within apps have their own currency and the users can earn more currency by completing offers. So companies like TapJoy, TrialPay, and others facilitate that, and you can promote within there. And last, of course, is social, which you know is basically exclusively Facebook. They focus mostly on app downloads, but that's you know a huge chunk of traffic. Uh, another basic is just basically the ad formats. You know, for starters, they're just smaller. Um, the upper left corner shows a 300 by 50 banner ad. That was part of the kind of classic MMA, mobile adverti um, advertising guideline ads. There were four sizes. That was the biggest. They went from 120 up to the 300. Um, somewhat more recently, we've had the 300 by 250 is a popular ad unit, and then the full page ad on the right. So th there's 
a gazillions of formats. You know, one thing that's different with mobile is it's much more fractured than desktop. But these are some of the you know kind of mainstay big ad units. So where can you buy ads? Um, the first area is really desktop sites. So a lot of popular desktop sites now get a tremendous amount of traffic on mobile. So Facebook, Google, Twitter, even Publishers Clearinghouse, now about 40% of our traffic's on mobile. So all those sources have quite a bit of, um, of traffic to sell you. Another area would be kind of mobile focus sources and networks. Uh, so companies like Admoda, Adphonic, Mobile Theory, and Mobi. Uh, you might have just heard recently, Millennial actually bought JumpTap. So there's a little bit of consolidation going in the market, but in general, there's still a lot of these kind of mobile-focused uh, sources. We'll talk more about those in just a sec. All right, cool. So I want to take you through um, our offer so you can have a frame of reference to something to think about how you promote. So our campaign is a mobile web offer. So it's not an app download or anything like that. Basically, you drive users to this mobile website. It's all optimized for the phone. As you can see, it looks pretty good in the phone, and it's pretty easy for the user to complete. It's just uh, five fields, one page submit, really easy. We have two uh, payouts, $1.50 for non-incent uh, traffic and $0.50 cents for incent. And we'll talk more about those in just a sec. Uh, one of the nice things with a mobile web offer like this is it can work on any mobile carrier and any mobile device. So. When you're looking at other mobile campaigns, you want to look out for that, see if they have restrictions. It's not as popular now, but for example, premium SMS campaigns were a really big uh, affiliate marketing space for a while. And a lot of those had very tight restrictions about what carriers would work and which ones wouldn't. Ours, for example, will just work on any carrier. But you want to be really mindful to know if there's any restrictions like that. We have restrictions in place just for kind of our own safety and whatnot, uh, no SMS, uh, no push notifications, and U.S. traffic only. Uh, SMS is kind of an um, interesting area, to say the least. Uh, it's a very powerful tool in some ways, but it comes with incredible penalties and it, incredible restrictions. And so I guess, you know, if you're interested in using that, you know, definitely <laughs> tread carefully and, you know, really make sure you know what you're doing because it, it can be a really dangerous spot. So our offer you know, is looking for email engaged people, 35 plus, uh, who have like ideally a sweepstakes or gaming orientation. So pretty basic stuff. All right, so one of the first things you're gonna wanna think about when uh, getting ready for a campaign is think about whether you're gonna use incent or non-incent traffic. I was, I was talking about that before. For example, our offer has two very different payouts. You know, we pay three times as much for non-incent and that's because, you know, quality is typically a lot higher for the non-incent. Um, if you're not familiar with it, so non-incent on the left, this is actually an ad unit of ours in Pandora. And so the user has no incentive to complete it. They just see the offer, and if they are interested, they can come and take it. And so there's, you know, the user has some interest in the offer. Uh, the flip side is something like this on the right, which is a TapJoy offer wall. And with this, the user's typically within some sort of game or app, like Coindozer or something like that, and they're interested in getting more tokens for that game. In some ways, they don't really care about the offer. They just want a way to get uh, more coins and tokens. So in that case, they're incented with these different uh, tokens or currency to complete your offer. That, it's hard to say like which one's good or bad. Obviously, the conversion rates on the incent can be tremendously higher. Um, you know, on the, we might see conversion rates on the non-incent, you know, of a small digit percent to 20% or something. And then some incent positions will have, you know, an 80% conversion rate. So, you know, very different animals. Um, so you, you, you'd really want to choose early on which one you're going to focus on and then, uh, you know, hammer away at that. So creating ads that work, you want to take a lot of things into consideration. Um, one is you really want to think about the devices you're going to promote the campaign on. This is getting easier as devices are beginning to kind of standardize a bit more. You know, that we have a lot of kind of large rectangular devices with touch screens and stuff like that and a lot of capabilities. But you still want to be mindful, uh, especially if you kind of dip down into deeper traffic, you'll want to know different things. The first one is what the screen size is. So it's kind of obvious, but the size of the banner ad 
is related to the size of the screen. So if you have an old boost clutch phone with a 128 pixel wide screen, that shows a 120 pixel ad. If you have an iPhone with a 300 something just uh, pixel wide screen, it shows a 300 pixel ad. So you'll want to match the ad units and make sure you have ad units to match the devices you want. The next one is the device capabilities. You know, what can the phone do? It's, you know, there's pretty dramatic differences. Again, this is consolidating as all these devices get more powerful, but you know, some can display video, some can't. Some have touch screens, some don't. Some have location, some don't. And so you want to know what the capabilities are. Uh, the next one is kind of internet accessibility. Uh, the network speeds have gotten faster and faster. Now we have 4G and LTE and things like that. But still, uh, typically, a connection over a Wi-Fi is far faster and has a lot lower latency than over a cellular network. And that then changes the ad units you can use. So you can use uh, a lot richer media if you have Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, next thing you want to think about the user experience and how the user is going to use your ad unit and progress through the offer. Ideally, you know, you look at the app or the website you're using, consider how the user is going to click from there over into the offer and how that whole interaction is going to work. As I said, the mobile has lots of different experiences, and so you'll want to have a good handle on what that actually is, and you'll want to pull out a phone and you know try it for yourself and really see what it's like on a phone in your hand. Um, another thing is you know the publisher's colors. The mobile apps especially have like some pretty wild colors. You don't want to think about are you trying to match those or contrast those, but there's definitely opportunities within that. So first uh, bit of stats. These are from a recent campaign uh, we did. So this is one source with one campaign over one week, so a very controlled section, same landing page, same everything. The only difference was the background color on these ads, so pretty kind of small difference. And you can see that uh, between the lowest click-through rate of 1.1% up to the highest, you know, one, almost 1 1.6, there's a pretty big difference in that click-through rate. And uh, the click-through rate is really going to help, depending on how you're buying the traffic, that could be a big variable in determining what the publisher is going to get for an eCPM. And so a lot of times click-through rate can be an important variable you want to think about because a lot of systems will, uh, especially like jump taps and others, they'll favor higher click-through rate ads. And so you want to be really cognizant of that. The next one is, you know, the users click from the ad over and then how many of them convert on the page. And it's, it's uh, we've seen lots of different patterns, but there's a lot of times where a real high click-through rate ad actually has a really high conversion rate too, and you know it's just kind of all in synergy. And those are ideally what you want because that's making the publisher happy, that's making the advertiser happy, um, and generally that's working well. And you definitely want to avoid the opposite where you have a low click-through rate, low conversion rate. So when you're hooking up with sources, what are some of the things you want to think about? Uh, the first one is to make sure they have accurate mobile tracking. There's gazillions of these different sources out there, and they have very different capabilities. Some are super sophisticated and have really detailed data. Other ones just kind of throw a page up there and can't tell you anything about it. Ideally, you really want to figure out, have a source with a postback URL who can tell you, you can tell them about all the conversions, and that way you can work together to optimize the campaign. If they don't have that postback URL or data, it's going to be a little trickier. Next thing you want to think about is how flexible their pricing is. Uh, some of these, this can even vary by salesperson or within a source, but in, uh, also different sources have kind of different policies. Ideally, you're going to want to find someone who's going to work with you and price different chunks of inventory differently. If they just want to do one $50,000 I.O. at one price, it's going to be hard to make that work versus working with you to say, okay, well, we'll charge you this much for that chunk and that much for this chunk. That will really increase your chances that you guys can work together and make it work. Uh, talking about the accurate mobile tracking, you want the tracking so that you can then make changes to the campaign. And ideally, what you want is someone who can then enact those changes at the source level. It's really frustrating when you run a campaign, you find out a certain set of traffic doesn't work, and you call the source, and they say, well, Sorry, we don't have any targeting like that, and we can't make it. We can't make any adjustments. So, you'll want to know right from the start: can these guys uh, target based on what you learn? Uh, last one is you just definitely want a, a responsive account manager. 
you know, it's, it's tricky to get these campaigns working, and so you're going to want someone who's going to be there working with you, who's going to take your call and really kind of get in the weeds with you and figure out how to make this thing work. So when you start up, I'd really recommend, instead of like spraying and praying, you know, think of a, all the sources out there and pick a couple that are going to work for you and really hammer on those for a while because otherwise it's going to be too confusing. You really want to get to know some sources and, and really kind of work those sources with a given campaign. Um, you know, like a lot of these things, you know, you got to spend money to make money. You got to work through all of the different challenges and, and count on the fact that it's going to take some time. The first thing you're going to really want to do is nail down what your uh, KPIs are, your key performance indicators. There's lots of different things to think about. You know, obviously the big two for sure are click-through rate and conversion rate, um, but they have kind of cousins of eCPM and eCPA. Those things will all be really important to understand so that you can work and watch those metrics to see which ones are going to work well and which ones aren't. Um, then when you're in a source, you're going to basically be trying to find little pockets of traffic that work well for your campaign and then really drill down into those. Last thing when you're um, with these sources, you're going to try and figure out how to balance um, volume and optimization. You know, we've had a tough time with this different times because you'll run a campaign and you'll find some traffic, for example, works super well, and then a bunch of other traffic might not, and so it's tempting to kind of basically block out all of the bad traffic. And then you might be left with a super profitable campaign that's you know, pulling in $4 a day at a huge ROI, and that's not what you want. Uh, so you really want to think about what, how can I maximize my total profit from this campaign? And so you're going to have to be careful with those optimizations and always think about how that's going to impact your volume. So we've, uh, past, especially in the past five years, made a lot of mistakes, um, and so hopefully you won't make them. Uh, the first one when working with sources is spending too little. You know, we found a new source, we get all excited, put a couple hundred bucks in, it's a disaster, and we walk away, that source sucks. Never want to talk to them again, and in that case, we spent too little and didn't really work hard enough on it. We've had other ones where we get all excited, drop 10, 15 grand, and it all goes away, and then we realized we spent too much, and we didn't think about that one and didn't kind of watch it closely enough. So you want to really figure out with your campaign how you can find the right sweet spot of you know, doing the right amount. Uh, another big mistake we made is uh, over-optimizing in the user interface. A lot of these sites, what they'll do is they have a UI that you log into yourself, these little self-service portals, and you can make adjustments on that. So, you know, traditionally they might have like different keywords or different ki kinds of traffic. It might say some obscure thing like entertainment versus games versus news, something that really doesn't make a lot of sense. And it can be tempting to, you know, kind of crank and shut off parts of traffic within that UI. The problem we found is a lot of times when you do that, you might be clobbering huge chunks of traffic unknowingly and missing out on some great opportunities. So. Say you fire up your campaign, you have the entertainment keyword or something, and it's a disaster. It might turn out that's just one placement within that keyword that's so bad. And so you don't want to shut off the whole thing and miss out on the good stuff there. Uh, another thing we didn't do at first is really kind of pay attention to the industry. Mobile's still you know, a relatively kind of tight-knit industry, which... Um, you know, there's interactions across it, and you want to know what's happening. We've had times where we start freaking out. We're like, oh, my God, our campaigns are a disaster. And, you know, it turns out that there's some big brands at the end of the quarter dropping big budgets. And so they're gobbling up a lot of the inventory we want, and it changed all of our metrics. And so that case, we weren't really being clued in enough to the industry, especially now uh, another one is, is big app promotion days. You'll want to figure out the key app promotion days and kind of plan accordingly. Um, another one's, you know, not talking with your account manager. These people, they're there to sell you inventory and they have a lot of tools that can help you. Remember when I was talking about blocking a whole keyword and missing out on stuff? A lot of times these account managers have separate tools behind the scenes and they can make adjustments more finely tuned than you can. The other thing is a lot of these networks operate kind of on a blind basis. And so they'll tell you, you know, placement K13, whatever. 
um, the actual account manager knows what placement that is. And they can tell you, they won't tell you, or they, you have to get them drunk and then they'll tell you. Um, but they, they can work with you and find stuff that will work like that. And they can kind of put pieces together that you can't. So you really want to work with them. Another one is not negotiating prices. Um, we'll talk about this in just a bit, but that, you know, that's an important one. You want to figure out how to work with them. So negotiating prices, the first thing to realize is the floor is not the floor and that not the lowest price you can pay. They come out of the, a lot of times, all bluster and they're like, 20 cent cost per click, you can't pay less than that. And it takes a little while, a little wrangling, but you, you can pay less than that. And so make sure you work with them and find a way because if you're paying kind of this other max, it, it's hard to compete. So what are the factors that will affect a price? Uh, the first one is volume, uh, and this unfortunately goes two ways. Uh, with some sources, if you buy a big block of inventory, you can negotiate uh, a better price with it. Unfortunately, some will kind of use that against you too. If you try and buy too much, they say, well, well, you, you, know, you seem like a big fish. You want to buy a lot of inventory, and they start trying to jack the price up on you. So you want to figure out with the given source how you can use volume to your advantage. Another big thing is the cost unit. Um, I think one thing we've done successfully is worked with a variety of cost units. Our system handles uh, basically five or six different ones. Some sources really want to sell on a CPM, you know, cost per impression or cost per click or cost per action. Generally what we found is if you work with the method that the source prefers most, you'll do best. Because if you push the source to work on a metric that they're not comfortable with, they get more conservative and they'll pull back and then you'll end up paying more. So you really want to figure out what they're comfortable with and then do the work to figure out how to make that work for you. Quality is an interesting thing because uh, every source will have a chunk of inventory that they consider high quality. And that might be total, it might be irrelevant to you. For example, uh, one of the big ad networks had uh, Angry Birds basically on an exclusive for a while. And to them, you know, such, such a cool name, they considered that a really high quality source. From our standpoint, it wasn't a very high quality source. And so what you want to do is figure out what quality means to you and what quality means to the source and then ideally find things that are very valuable to you and not very valuable to the source. Because if you're buying the thing that's valuable to them, they're going to they're gonna charge you for it. Uh, another one's rich versus static ads. So remember we talked about those banner ads and stuff which were basically just images typically or sometimes animated GIFs or things like that. There's also much richer ad units, which can have like a little video or a little interaction. Traditionally, those were very expensive. They'd be four or five times as expensive as a static ad unit on the media. And then sometimes you had to pay, you know, many thousands of dollars just to set the thing up. What we found is a lot of the networks now are uh, kind of throwing in the rich ad units at basically the same price. And so you'll want to see and test those out to see if you can use a rich ad unit. Um, like I said, they're still trying to reserve those for brands, but if you can negotiate with them, you might be able to get a, a much better ad unit for the same price. Uh, last one is device and carrier. Um, that can be a huge determiner of what, what the cost of the traffic will be. So for example, uh, historically on JumpTap, the cost per click was say 10 cents. But then in talking with your account manager, you found they had a special on iPhone inventory because they had a lot of it for five cents. And then they had another special on prepaid inventory for three cents. And so we, we spent a lot of time and focus on that prepaid inventory because you know, they had a hard time selling it and so we could buy it really cost effectively. So each case you want to think about how the device and carrier is going to impact traffic. Um, we'll talk more about device groups in a second, but say like Windows Mobile, I don't know how many of you have Windows devices, Windows Mobile devices, but it's not huge, but for any given affiliate, that's a lot of traffic. And if no one else wants it, and you can figure out a way to negotiate a great price on it, you know, still millions of users on that site, on that kind of device, and so that could be a good opportunity. One of the other tricks with uh, negotiating prices is moving a partner to a CPA from a CPC or CPM, uh, even when they don't normally do that. And one of the ways we do that is we uh, typically will gain their trust by doing a guaranteed buy. 
So we might say, okay, you're not familiar with the campaign, we'll do five grand at a CPC, test it out, uh, you can learn about the campaign, you can get your metrics, and then we're gonna move to a CPA. Um, that's ended up working out really well for us because that you know, helps us create campaigns that can be a lot more effect, easy to manage and can tap into different pockets of inventory they have. So, so how can you get one cent clicks? Uh, the, you can, it's crazy with mobile, there's such a variety of cost of inventory in different pockets. One of the things we found is you know, a typical mobile site you know, they try and have their inventory and they try and sell it, and then the remaining parts, unfilled inventory, the stuff they can't sell. There's a lot of sites that might have, say, 20% unfilled inventory, all the way down to 80% unfilled inventory. So some of these sites have a tremendous amount of inventory they just can't sell. And so if you can work with them, find the pockets of stuff they can't sell, you can usually negotiate ridiculous prices with them. So we have a lot of sources where we're kind of tapped into those chunks of inventory and ready to buy it uh, for a ridiculous price. Doesn't always work. I mean, we have campaigns sub penny all the way to you know, thirty cents or so. So, you know, it's all different. Uh, depends on the inventory. But it, again, you just want to negotiate for that inventory. What's the best you can get? Cool. So now let's talk about optimization for a bit. There's. Uh, many things you can optimize on, but I want to touch on some that are very different in mobile versus the desktop. The first is I think ad size has some interesting attributes. Placement blocking, that's kind of similar to desktop, but then uh, device and carrier targeting. Those offer some you know, interesting variables to, that make some pretty big differences. The first is this ad size. So remember I said that with the rectangular ads, there's four standard sizes. Uh, ranging from 300 is the big one that would be on iPhone and Android devices, down to 120, which would be on kind of those old feature phones and things like that. We've seen this pattern a couple of times, many times before, where these top two ad units kind of, you know, operate normally. And then the smallest ad unit goes gangbusters, and the second smallest is horrible. And at first, we we're like, what the heck is going on here? Like, you know, I could understand if bigger ads are always better or smaller ads are always better, but like what the heck's going on? Then what we figured out is these different ad sizes basically correlate to different types of devices. So the 120 is typically hooked up with like a feature phone with a very, very small screen. And those, uh, for a variety of reasons, have always performed really well. So that makes sense that that guy is doing well. The 168, however, is kind of hooked up with these screwy devices, um, you know, things like a BlackBerry 9700 and these, I don't know, kind of bizarre old devices. And traditionally, those have just worked very, very poorly for us. Um, so you want to be on the lookout for that. Again, like it's a small, small consideration, this ad size. But, you know, if the source knows more than you and they're dumping a bunch of this 168 stuff on you, that might really slow down your campaign and you might not even kind of see it in their dashboard or anything like that. Uh, another one is obviously placement blocking. So this could be even within one publisher, you know, different parts of their traffic or for a network, different publishers or different uh, placements on publishers. We've seen typically a similar pattern where um, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, kind of does average. A couple of killer, really good ones, and then a couple of just really evil placements. Um, and so you're going to want to find and hunt down those pl evil placements and probably block those pretty quickly because that's going to just tear into your budget and waste a lot of money. Uh, so instead of killing yourself on some of these other optimizations, you know, pull those bad placements out and then get a clearer picture of what you're trying to optimize. Uh, so I talked about how there's different kinds of devices. We, we think of different major device groups. Um, this chart is different depending on uh, how you measure things. If you measure it by people, ad dollars spent, ad units sold, you know, all the numbers come out a little different. The story that is consistent is that Android and Apple are the two big ones by far, and Android's growing against Apple. So you really want to probably, you know, it probably makes sense to pay attention to both those. But then again, you know, BlackBerry with their 7%, that's not nothing. You know, it's, it's been... There's a lot of people who have kind of left that for dead, and so if you can find a way to make it work, that, that could be a good opportunity. Same thing with Windows. 
Um, but these different device groups are important to understand because these can, uh, one, they can be things you can optimize against. You could just buy Apple inventory or Android inventory, and they have some pretty different characteristics. For example, one alone is just income. Uh, iOS devices have a much higher personal income than Android devices, and that makes sense if you think about it, that um, you know, traditionally you had to buy an Apple device on Verizon or AT&T, and it was you know, many hundreds of dollars, versus Android's been a lot broader in uh, availability. This, though, is getting a little blurrier because iOS is available on more devices. One thing, you know, like an iPad mini or an iPod touch, um, that'll get lumped in here. And then just the flagship kind of iPhones are getting a lot cheaper, especially the older models. Uh, so that's making this a little trickier. And so that's why um, we uh, keep coming up with different ideas about different device uh, groups and what that means. And that can be really useful for your marketing, but you're going to want to retest that. Because mobile is changing so quickly, if you come up with a theory, there's a good chance six months from now it's changed. And so if you find traffic that doesn't work, six months later, I'd, you know, I'd say try it again, because you know, th the situation may have changed. And so you really want to figure out what's going on there. Another big variable for us is uh, the handset. So this is just within the Android device group. So all of these are Android devices. In some ways, you'd think of them very similar. And it's wild, too, if you look even within a given manufacturer. Look at these top two devices, a ZTE score and a Huawei Prism, versus the bottom two are this from the same two manufacturers, you know, a ZTE Avid 4G and a Huawei Activa 4G. And so, We've like beat our head against the walls a lot of times trying to create uh, different theories on why some devices are good and some aren't. And it's really hard and it changes by campaign. So I, I guess I'd recommend not doing that and wasting your time. Instead, just figure out what's working, what's not, the stuff that's not, probably block it out. Maybe if you're ambitious, go back and uh, run a special campaign with those crappy devices and see if you can work through it. Uh, typically, we've always had a hard time doing that, so, but that could be an opportunity. Another uh, big area difference between kind of mobile and desktop is the carrier. So on desktop, the ISP is really totally irrelevant value. You know, if someone has cable vision or Roadrunner or Time Warner, like no one cares. Um, but the difference between cell phone carriers actually has a much bigger difference. And so this is not at all like an ISP in terms of the marketing. One of the reasons is because the different plans uh, appeal to different users. You know, they, these companies target different users, and they have very different pricing plans. You know, for example, Verizon historically has been the high-quality, high-cost carrier, and AT&T a relatively high cost as well, versus Metro and Boost were you know, pretty cheap and open for a different demographic. Um, Again, this is getting blurred a little bit because companies, the postpaid carriers, are starting to offer prepaid plans, and the prepaid plans are running cool ads in the Super Bowl and trying to get higher end customers. But it still plays out pretty strongly that these prepaid are, you know, go to a, a kind of subprime demographic more often than not. And so, if you have a campaign that fits that, you really want to kind of drill down into that. Here's just a chart with uh, one campaign we ran on Millennial back in March. So all the same ads, same source, same campaign, same landing page. The only difference here is the carrier. And as you can see, this is the cost per uh, act, uh, conversion. Verizon, AT&T are uh, substantially more expensive than Metro and T-Mobile. And so it's tricky because for our campaign, for example, these uh, Metro and stuff's a lot cheaper on the front end but then might not be as high a quality a user. And so you'll want to kind of balance that out depending on the campaign. The last big variable that's really kind of screwing things up a bit is uh, Wi-Fi traffic. So more and more devices are spending more, consuming more internet through Wi-Fi. We always think a mobile is kind of on the go, but the number one place to use a mobile phone is in your living room. And so a lot of people are surfing the web on a mobile on Wi-Fi. And this does a couple of things. Um, one, on the positive side, like I said, it's, a, it's generally a really good data connection. And so the consumer 
is in a place where they can buy, they've got some time, they can consume relatively rich content, you know, video ads, things like that. The big problem is this basically screws up and breaks all the carrier targeting. Because now the user's not coming through the cell phone network, but they're coming through the Wi-Fi network. And so when you look at the user, it says Roadrunner as opposed to AT&T. Um, and so like I said, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, traditionally, when we were trying to get a campaign working, a lot of times we'd shut off Wi-Fi, but it's, it's a really big chunk of traffic. And so ideally, you can find a way to work with it, but just know you have to kind of give up the carrier targeting. So um, I would say that mobile affiliate marketing is really kind of tricky. There's a lot of variables to work through. Um, but I just wanted to show you this chart of a recent affiliate of ours. You know, they just kept hammering away, and then you know, they finally made a couple optimizations and you know, 10x their revenue overnight. So there's huge opportunities. There's a big audience. There's a, a lot you can do. And uh, so I'd encourage you all to give it a try. Cool. So uh, that was my presentation. What questions are signed? Can I answer? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the question was about responsive design. And what responsive design, it can mean a couple of different things. But uh, there's one approach where you make kind of a dedicated desktop site, and then another where you make a dedicated mobile site. And those have don't share CSS or HTML or anything. And then there's another method where you make a responsive design site. And with that, you make one site. And then the CSS and JavaScript has different things to basically modify the page depending on the screen size. I think the geeks really like responsive design because it makes their world easier and they can just have one set of things. And uh, we've generally found through a lot of testing that it doesn't work. Um, you generally end up with just a shitty experience for both. So I would recommend instead, depending on the site, you know, how important mobile is to you to make a mobile first design you either make a mobile first design that can be expanded to desktop or make two different dedicated designs. Uh, with PCH, we've tested a number of different emails with a desktop only, uh, mobile only, mobile first, and responsive design. Um, I think every test, the responsive design's lost. Des uh, mobile first is actually done really pretty well, even on desktop traffic, because mobile first usually is you know, pretty focused design. And that works well even on desktop. And then even desktop seems to work well on mobile. Um, one of the things, there's a lot of little caveats with responsive design. For example, one is uh, Gmail. With it, if you send a responsive design email, you have a, a link to a style sheet. Gmail, by default, strips that out. And so all of a sudden, your responsive design is not responding, and you have one. Um, so that, that might change as devices keep changing. But for now, we found it's really worth the effort to make a dedicated mobile experience. Cool, yeah? Do you have any stats on demos in terms of age, what age groups convert better, and also what categories of offers convert better? Yeah, definitely. And that, so a couple of years ago, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the term like digital divide. So 15 years ago, there was this notion that certain parts of the US demographic got on the desktop internet earlier, and certain parts of the US were kind of left behind. Mobile actually went back backwards, and so uh, typically ethnic minorities and younger people embraced mobile earlier and were a big part of the mobile internet. So a couple years ago, you definitely wanted to focus on subprime offers. Things like education was you know huge on uh, mobile then because that that fit with the audience. What we found is, and the audience was generally younger to answer the younger age part. What we found is it's really blurring, you know, and now, especially with Android, and, you know, it's mobile still younger than desktop, but it's really pretty broad. Um, so we keep comparing our age group we get versus what Publishers Clearinghouse gets when they do a TV campaign. And now our mobile advertising age group is actually older than their TV audience they get. And it has a uh, median age of about 40, like 40, 42. Um, so it's, it's much broader, which makes the targeting trickier. Um, so I think for now, it's still best to focus on relatively broad offers that are pretty easy for the user. It's hard to get them to commit to do something. So you really want to have a pretty kind of low bar 
with a broad offer in general. Yeah. Have you seen any credit card submit offers work, or is it strictly lead gen offers? We've seen very little where I actually have to purchase a product or something. Uh, very few of those work. Uh, you know, it's just really hard to get the user to pull out a uh, card on their phone. There's still a lot of concern. I don't know if you remember, initially people were concerned about putting credit cards through the desktop internet. You know, they thought, well, somehow this magic cloud's going to steal my credit card and Russians are going to run off with stuff. Um, that's the fear now with mobile. And so I think it's still so new that a lot of consumers aren't comfortable with that. The only place we've seen that work is different marketplaces that have a, kind of a, a login account or a wallet. So like an Amazon or Google Wallet or eBay, PayPal, um, those can work because the consumer doesn't have to pull out a credit card. They just log into the thing. So I, I tend more to those. Cool. What else? Yeah. Is the only offer you promote the publisher thing? We promote, uh, so we pro promote a couple hundred offers within our flow. Uh, the lead offer we promote the most is Publishers Clearinghouse. But we do promote other kind of lead offers, front offers. Um, That's question. Yeah, definitely. What kind of tracker do you use? We have an in-house solution we built to track all this data. Um, and so it collects all those stats I was talking about, uh, you know, the individual placement, publisher. Uh, we have a notion we call an ad ID, uh, which tracks those. And then when the user comes to our site, we, try and we figure out what device they have. We take their IP and match that up to a carrier table and figure out what carrier they have. So we, we have kind of an internal database that tracks all those. Um, what we found is that was really helpful early on. One of the challenges, though, sometimes is our database doesn't match the media partner's database. And so a lot of the media partners have their own database. And if you're building something now, I'd probably focus on just recording what the media partner says. Because if we go to them and say, hey, you need to block an AVID 4G, and they look in their network and they say, I don't, I don't know what that is, that doesn't help you. So ideally, you can get the publisher to pass parameters to you and then just track those parameters. Do you ever redirect based on like, device on your end? Oh, yeah, definitely. So we have a lot of rules built in about checking the device, and um, you know, especially uh, with apps, for example. You know, a lot of apps would be either iOS only or Android only. Uh, so a lot of those are offers would be uh, device targeted for sure. Yeah. Like, what about the markets like Latin America Brazil? I think there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, we, we've looked into uh, emerging markets and tried to figure out how we could operate in them. Uh, you know, it's tough since we really don't have any Spanish-speaking people in my office, but uh, we've still tried. Uh, we had a, um, so I, I would definitely check those out. The thing that's wild is a lot of the dynamics are very, very different. Uh, so, you know, for example, they have campaigns there. I think there's actually a good opportunity because their cell phone carriers are a lot less restrictive than U.S. carriers, and so you can do kind of more aggressive billing. Uh, for example, in Mexico, you can do a one-click billing through the carrier without any kind of pin submit or anything like that that you need here in the US. So I think it's a good opportunity. We've just haven't done anything great with it. Sorry, what was the question about services you said? Or? Uh, I guess I'm still unsure, but you know, there, there's definitely a huge variety of different offers that you know work well in in the market. Uh, you know, everything from life insurance to all sorts of stuff. So, you know, I'd test them all out and see what works for a given set of traffic. What's the most successful inside our network? I mean, the Publishers Clearinghouse offer for sure. I mean, you know. It's, they give millions of dollars away, um, and it's got a relatively short form. Um, what we found typically is that the form has a huge impact. You know, it's just, you know, I encourage you all to definitely test out the form yourself, and if you're not willing to fill out a 15-field form, you know, I wouldn't spend too much media on it either. Um, so I, I think we found that short forms work best. Generally, pretty broad offers, again, work well, um, but I'd focus on those. Cool, yeah. 
guess, how successful have you been with the media arbitrage, and what percentage of your overall traffic does that represent? So historically, uh, um, you know, before a year ago, 100% was media arbitrage, where we'd buy in a CPC and we had converting to a CPA. Now, you know, honestly, we're kind of sharing that risk with our affiliates and publishers, so uh, we're pushing out CPA. So most of the partners we're working with now are on a CPA or rev share, and then they kind of are arbitraging that. But you definitely can make it work. Uh, you know, it's just for us now at the scale that Publisher Clearinghouse wants to operate at, it's just it's too tough to find all those, but there's tons of opportunities to arbitrage still. Cool, what other, other questions? Yeah. Do you use a landing page with the Publishers Clearinghouse software? Well, yeah, we, we have the kind of key landing page. Oops. You have your own before that, and collect that data, and make it like list off that yourself? Well, we're part, we, they own us, um, so. We can't scam them, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, no, we we have that. That's our page, and that posts right into their database. We we have kind of a separate database we use too. Um, we've seen people put landing pages before this, and that can work all right. Uh, generally, you know, we got to focus on the approved creative and stuff like that. But um, we've seen people put kind of lead landing pages and help that help that situation a lot. We have a, yeah, there's definitely, uh, so we're messing around. This is largely a one page field with five, um, five fields, one page. Um, but we have some, there are other guys in the marketplace that do some, some similar stuff, like a Q Interactive and Egenic and stuff, where they'll actually have a two page version of the same one. Um, we're testing that out. We haven't had great luck with two page. This flow actually is 10 pages long, um, and a surprising number of users get through that. So you definitely can. You just have to work on the copy and stuff to figure out how you're going to keep them, you know, motoring through. In terms of number of fields, you know, that, that can be really tricky. And one thing is it definitely depends on what the question's asking. Um, you know, an offer category that we've always been excited about but just can't make work is auto insurance. And one of the killers is a lot of times they want an actual VIN, you know, the whole car VIN, which is, you know, this crazy long number and letters, and so that field is just deadly. Um, we found some weird things where there's different fields with different sets of users that they're kind of more or less willing to give. Uh, one shocking one is that they're pretty, gener pretty open with phone number, you know, which historically that should be kind of a, a field you wouldn't really want to fill out, uh, but users fill out phone number probably more easily than email in a lot of cases. Um, and one reason is there's a good chunk of users who just don't have email or don't focus on email now. They just do text. And so, you know, the phone number can, can work really well. So the, the different fields definitely aren't create equal, but definitely getting past five, six fields gets, gets pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, you talked about how there's tons of Wi-Fi traffic and it's kind of difficult to work with. Can you give any tips into, like, where you found success working with Wi-Fi traffic and how to kind of that's a good question. I don't know if you have any good ideas, Chris. Sometimes maybe at, you know, kind of going to the placement level too can help with it. Um, you know, definitely a while ago, we were pretty quick to just shut it off, but it's not really an option anymore. So we have to kind of work through it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would urge you in those cases to, to find another metric that you can optimize around, um, whether it's the device type or the placement. And then the other thing is, you know, you can block Wi-Fi as a whole. So you should take kind of the aggregate performance of all the Wi-Fi traffic and just really know, you know, is this better or worse than what I'm getting from the carriers? Um, and then make a decision there. Um, and, uh, you know, I really find that getting granular in how you set up these campaigns, you know, maybe take the Wi-Fi out, separate it out, test some different creatives there, um, and then you can sort of optimize towards that other segment. That's a great point. That's one tactic we've used a lot. So if you're having trouble with Wi-Fi, you know, just make a wholly separate Wi-Fi campaign, and then you can, like you said, you can try and optimize within that. That helps. Yeah, I've seen with, um, you know, if you find like a good device, mm -hmm. then you know you open it up to all those, all the Wi-Fi, and that can. So that's a great, you know, 
find a metric that's working really well, and then you know, kind of see if you can expand on that. And the great point with that is a lot of times a device is tied to a carrier sometimes, and so if you do find the device you want, there's a good chance that's still from the carrier, and even if the you know user's not going through the carrier network at that time. Cool. What other questions? All right. Cool. Oh. Right. What types of offers do you see work on Pandora? Published clearinghouse offer um, <laughs> works well. Um, we haven't had a ton of luck with other ones. We've tested some other guys and haven't had great luck with it. Um, they have, you know, the genre targeting is probably one of the big tools, you know, so you can target different, you know, Toby Keith listeners versus other kind of listeners. Um, and so that helps a lot, but, you know, we've, we've had a, a bit of a tricky time. They have a ton, of, a ton of inventory and they're great to work with, so I think you can definitely find some stuff, but beyond the PCH offer, we've had, you know, a little bit of tough luck with them. And also with Pandora, um, keep in mind that to use that service, you have to register. So a big way you can help your campaign on Pandora is try to access that information to either pre-pop your form or, or ease the user experience. Um, we haven't been able to do that with our offer because we're very, very compliant. But if you have you know, more open, less stringent uh, rules around the offers you're running, that might be a good way to have success with Pandora. So you can pass the user Pandora info to the offer. Right. Yeah. yeah, they call it like tap to register, I think. Um, and there's a limited number of fields. I think it's, it's an email, name, maybe zip code or something. But you know, just a couple, a handful of fields. But if you can get away with those, it's pretty slick. Yeah. He said earlier that it's important to know what's going on in the industry. So, for example, if you work globally, I mean, for example, I, I'm mostly based in Europe, but so these Black Friday sales, right. stuff, so this is an American thing. So maybe there's a Chinese thing like that. So how do you know about these things? Is there a good source for this kind of events? And you also said like app promotion days and stuff. Like how do you learn about that? Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, we, we still, so we have a 20 person group just focused on mobile for PCH and still we can only do US because I think you do need that attention to the industry. Uh, we, we actually put a push into international traffic earlier this year and I think we just weren't tuned in enough to each of the different categories. Uh, so I'd really, I'd make sure you focus on kind of one area, you, you know, Europe, US, Latin America, um, and then make sure you're talking to all the key players in that all the time. So talking to the sources, find out what other offers are hot, talking to the different offers, find out what sources are hot, and um, we just gotta keep connecting with these people. We, you know, there's some industry news sites like a mobile marketer and different things like that. But generally, I think we found the best luck in talking with the individual people and learning kind of really what's going on. Cool. Any other questions or yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, regarding the ads, right? Like so many ads, they they have an absolute size, but uh, I think for retina displays, mm -hmm. you possibly have higher resolution for the same size of the ads. But I have not really seen networks that allow you to put those high res ads. Do, do, is that why? That's a great <laughs> question. Yeah, they just. So the question about the retina displays and how that affects the ad size units, everything we've seen is that they still just take a 300 by 50 or a 320 by 60 ad unit and just scale it up. Yeah. So I don't know why you can't. I think you can on iAd. So on Apple's proprietary platform you can. But I don't think I've seen any of the networks do that. Cool. I think that's all the time we had. Thanks for your uh, attention. Uh, Chris and I will be around if you want to learn more about our offer or any other questions. Thanks.